Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the NCD Alliance webinar. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. And at this time, I'd like to turn things over to Jessica Bigley, Policy Research Manager at NCD Alliance. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Thank you ever so much for joining. Great to have you all on the line. Um, we've got uh, next slide, please. It's the start of a busy summer for those of us in the northern, northern hemisphere and a, a busy winter, I guess, for those in the southern hemisphere. Um, on the agenda today, we've got updates from the 71st World Health Assembly that took place last month, um, followed by a guest presentation from the European Public Health Alliance on trade and NCDs, um, then preparations for the UNHLM on NCDs taking place in September, um, updates on the NCD Alliance's campaign Enough, and finally, a focus on our views, our voices. Next slide, please. Um, so you'll be hearing from myself and then my colleagues Priya, Lucy, and Christina at the NCD Alliance, um, and also George Thurley, who's kindly on the line from the European Public Health Alliance. Um, I'd invite you and strongly encourage you to type your questions in the Q&A box that you can see on the left of your screen, um, and then we'll be inviting um, the speakers to feedback after each presentation on those questions. Next slide, please. Um, so you've got me to start with, and then you'll have a break from me and hear from everybody else as well. So starting with updates on the 71st World Health Assembly. Next slide, please. Um, a few highlights, first of all. Um, there were some key publications launched out just prior to the World Health Assembly and also in, during the World Health Assembly itself. Um, so the first one, which I'm sure many of you around the phone are aware of, um, is the launch of WHO's investment case, Saving Lives, Spending Less, a Strategic Response to NCDs. Um, and you can see those key statistics flagged there um, on the slide, but obviously really, really useful to have this in the lead up to the high level meeting um, and trying to encourage uh, countries to be investing more and more in NCDs, given that the cost of um, action is far outweighed by the cost of inaction. Um, at WHA itself, there was, of course, the Walk the Talk event on Sunday the 20th of May, and my colleague Lucy will be covering that um, later on in the webinar. Uh, throughout the week, there were over 30 NCD side events. Uh, the NCD community was not only out in force, but it was more vocal and more engaged than ever. Um, a lot of the side events were under the theme of health for all at this World Health Assembly, um, and many of them were, were somewhat generic um, and not focused on any specific disease. So it was so fantastic to see that NCDs were, were really, really well covered. Um, also, on the Monday morning of WHA, um, I can just see a note saying that my audio has stopped. Okay, that's fine. It's still working. Um, there was a, a joint report launched by NCD Alliance and Eli Lilly on the Monday morning um, on integrated care. Uh, really recognizing the need for NCDs to be existed into platforms that are better established for other health areas like RMNCAH and infectious diseases, um, and also given um, the increasing burden of NCD comorbidities. Um, particularly relevant to emphasize that this is the report is really based on interviews conducted with those who are working in the field, and it contains detailed case studies um, from a range of countries around the world. So I really hope that that might be useful for, for lots of our network. And finally, there is a summary of the events that took place at the World Health Assembly focused on um, discussions on the official agenda specifically available at that link right at the bottom. And hyperlinks aren't active in the webinar right now, but they will be um, once, the once the slides are uploaded on our website after the call. Next slide, please. Thank you. So beginning with um, the agenda item that's of most interest to everybody around um, on, on the webinar today. Um, in terms of preparation for the third UN high-level meeting on NCDs, uh, member states obviously flagged the need for a whole-of-society approach, which has been such a key part of our, part of our um, advocacy for as long as the NCD movement has, has existed, really, but great to see that reflected in member state statements as well. Um, the need for financial investment, um, following on from the comments on the previous slide, and also the importance of public awareness campaigns. Public awareness campaigns is always fairly delicate because it shifts the and the burden of responsibility really away from government slightly to, to individuals. Um, and obviously it is important to educate individuals and to ensure that everybody's well informed about day-by-day um, -day choices that are made. But we're sometimes cautious when member states place a strong emphasis on public awareness campaigns that they might be trying to shift the dialogue towards individual blame. Um, was, Malaysia mentioned the challenge of policy coherence between economics and trade um, and talking about how this impacts on healthy environments. 
Um, and this obviously links to what George will be talking about later for us. Portugal, on a plus side, committed becoming a trans fat free country, and the UK will be hosting the first ever global ministerial summit on mental health, which is great news. Nice to be in the UK on a day when news like this comes through. Um, Italy, however, questioned the application of fiscal policies to food and ingredients. Italy didn't dispute the application of fiscal policies to tobacco or spirits, but this obviously is concerning, especially given that Italy is a, a co-facilitator um, for the UN high-level meeting. Uh, there was a, a resolution adopted uh, which urged representation at the level of heads of government and heads of state, which is great, um, and it also welcomed the Montevideo roadmap. Uh, this was slightly weakened from the initial language that had been proposed, which was on the endorsement of the Montevideo roadmap. That's still great to see it in there. Next slide, please. In terms of the 13th general program of work, um, several member states in the Euro and EMRO region made direct reference to NCDs in their statements. Uh, Qatar urged WHO to step up measures to overcome obstacles in NCD prevention and control. Pakistan highlighted the need for predictable resources for NCDs and mental health alongside health emergencies. So great to see NCDs uh, portrayed as being on the same level as health emergencies, um, while the Netherlands noted um, NCD to be a particular priority alongside AMR. Um, Finland emphasized how a higher burden of NCDs and infectious outbreaks pose a threat to the sustainability of entire health systems. Um, the resolution that was adopted approves the GPW 13 and requests the WHO Director General to provide a report to the 75th World Health Assembly to inform potential extension to 2025 on the GPW 13 in order to align with the wider UN planning cycle. Um, Tedros also referred to the GPW 13 as a living document and expressed openness to hearing requests for elaboration on the new country model and concerns over the indicator and proclaimed that it's our partnership that will translate the plan into action. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the discussions that took place on health, environment and climate change, there were three reports. Um, one specifically on health, the environment, and climate change, then a report um, on the roadmap for an enhanced global response to the adverse health effects of air pollution, and then a third paper on human health and biodiversity. And just worth flagging a really key statistic um, that was put across in one of those reports that shows that 24% of all adult deaths from heart disease, 25% from stroke, 43% from COPD, and 29% from lung cancer are attributable to air pollution. Um, Bulgaria noted that climate change affects everything and there is a need to promote actions that benefit everyone, um, while other member states also call for multi-sectoral action, action beyond the health sector and promotion of co-benefit outcomes. Uh, the paper on biodiversity um, discusses the importance of no regrets measures and some countries were concerned that this might result in, in an overreaction and in countries being too cautious in the measures that they're implementing. Um, but overall, member states noted the three reports that had been prepared. Um, WHO um, spoke about the increased collaboration that's occurring within WHO between the Cluster for Climate and Other Determinants of Health, um, so that's Joyce St. John's Cluster, um, and the NMH Cluster, Svetlana Axel Rodscross Cluster, in the lead up to the HLM. Um, and the reason for this is to take um, the opportunity to address NCDs by reducing the burden of air pollution and other environmental risks. Um, Joy St. John was also very, very clear that the no regrets measures are simultaneously good for health and environment. And there's a need to respect commitments made elsewhere, including in the um, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and the Convention on Biological Diversity, showed that these measures are based on the best available evidence um, and that they would, and that WHO would continue to um, promote action around the, the no regrets measures. Um, yeah, so very much making the point that lack of evidence was, or lack of evidence that some member states deem to be sufficient is no excuse um, not to be cautious. Um, and finally, she said that it will be necessary to find ways to uncouple economic growth and poverty alleviation from environmental degradation. Um, we are really glad at um, the World Health Assembly as well to hear um, multiple references made to a five by five approach uh, for NCD prevention and control. So that includes mental health as the fifth disease and air pollution as the fifth risk factor. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the high level meeting on ending tuberculosis, um, obviously we're really keen to see as much collaboration between the NCD and TB communities as, as possible. Um, around this to make the most of there being two high-level meetings back-to-back -back on the 26th and the 27th of September. 
And so in member state discussions, member states noted the need for multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder approaches to eliminate TB with leadership from the very highest level, so very similar to our own calls um, for NCDs. And the importance of ensuring access to early diagnosis and quality and affordable treatment and the integration of TB services into UHC with a patient-centered approach and reaching vulnerable populations. So very, very similar to what we're asking for at the NCD level and reinforcing the need for collaboration across the NCD and TB communities. And there was a resolution adopted which requests WHO to support member states in preparations for the HLM, TBHLM, that is, to implement the Moscow Declaration from last year and to provide technical and strategic leadership and support. And of note, there will be a draft accountability framework um, presented at the HLM on the 26th of September, which is great, and probably some lessons there that can be extrapolated for the NCD response. And there will also be a report to the 72nd World Health Assembly on the implementation of the resolution. Next slide, please. Um, there was a fantastic reaction from member states um, in discussions on physical activity for health. I, I don't think I've ever heard such unanimous support for a particular agenda item. Um, the action plan was warmly welcomed and wholeheartedly supported all around. The contribution of physical activity um, to reducing the burden of NCDs was well noted and also more broadly to um, how improving levels of physical activity will help to achieve the SDGs. Um, countries noted that NCDs are on the rise regardless of country income level and that no country can ignore individual risk factors. Um, South Africa and actually other member states made similar comments um, really reinforce the links with physical environment. Uh, there were lots of comments about the links between physical activity and urbanization. Um, there's a need for a multi-sectoral approach and to create real active systems that involve parents, educators, and employers. Um, India announced that it aims to include 200 million children in a massive national sports program, which is fantastic news again, and Thailand on behalf of the Southeast Asia region. Um, said that it looks forward to an era of physical activity for all rather than the target and in the plan to reduce prevalence of physical inactivity. And finally, there was general acknowledgement of the need um, of better monitoring and evaluation, including reporting of disaggregated data <coughs> Excuse me. emerging out of the fact that obviously physical activity varies a great deal across different groups, um, including by gender and by age. So the resolution adopts a target of a 15% reduction in prevalence of physical inactivity in adults and adolescents by 2030 and has some, some calls to the WHO Director General, including on implementation of the action plan, um, finalizing a monitoring and evaluation framework by the end of the year, producing the first global status report on physical activity by the end of 2020 and updating the 2010 global recommendations on physical activity for adult, adolescents and adults and to report back the WHA um, at almost five-year intervals beginning in 2021. Next slide, please. And yeah, just a reminder to everybody in the call that we, we'd love you to, to submit questions um, in, in the chat box. Thank you very much. Um, for um, agenda item 12.3 on women's, children's, and adolescents' health, um, it was well noted that investing in um, women, girls, and adolescents is essential for the health and well-being of populations and for sustainable development. <coughs> um, violence against women and girls is very much a public health issue with implications for mental health. Um, and that proper nutrition, especially in the first thousand days, is key to development and health outcomes in later life and obviously has implications for, for NCD risk in addition to, to those that have been recognized for, for many more decades. There were some tensions on language around access to safe abortions. Some member states um, do not view it as a human right or a component of maternal health, while others do. Um, countries that made a statement against abortion included the US and Niger, um, while countries that supported um, included Norway. In terms of actions for the WHO Secretariat, WHO will be working with partners to develop guidelines to fast-track implementation of the Nurturing Care Framework and also to accelerate implementation of the Cervical Cancer Flagship Program linked to the GPW. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of discussions on mHealth, um, member states noted that there had been a, a complete transition from a digital health re revolution to a digital health movement. Um, mHealth is obviously extremely innovative, but it's the appreciation for how mHealth and digital health can contribute to public health. 
um, have become much, much more widespread in recent years, uh, not least thanks to the WHOYTU Be Healthy, Be Mobile initiative. Um, it was noted that M Health has the ability to bolster health systems, especially those which are overburdened, um, to enable widespread access to healthcare even in the remotest populations and offer daily support um, for individuals living with NCDs or other chronic conditions. In the resolution, there are 11 actions to member states. Um, so the ones just to highlight are considering how digital technologies could be integrated into existing health care system infrastructures um, to develop legislation and data protection policies around issues including data access, sharing, consent, and security privacy. Um, innovation in mHealth is moving extremely quickly, and it's just important that the data keeps up with that. <coughs> there are also eight actions for the WHO. Director General, including to provide technical assistance and normative guidance to member states for scaling up the implementation of mHealth uh, to ensure that there's proper coordination around this, and to develop regulations and evidence uh, related to improvements um, and avoid any unintended effects. And there'll be a report submitted to the 73rd World Health Assembly. Next slide, please. And um, there were some discussions, um, both public and closed door, around maternal, infant, and young child nutrition. <coughs> um, so member state um, interventions primarily focused on welcoming um, the biannual reports mentioned here with strong support for protection and promotion of breastfeeding. Um, 13 member states submitted a draft resolution on infant and young child feeding, um, and this was followed by an alternative decision point um, by the US and member states spent a total of 14 hours over two days in a drafting group negotiating a new resolution that was finally proposed. We don't have all the details of these internal discussions, um, but Thailand, which, which chaired the drafting group, um, noted that a lot of member states had gone beyond the boundaries that had been set by their capitals um, and thanked the, those that were actually in the negotiating room for their flexibility in this regard. Um, in the resolution, which was eventually sponsored by 18 member states, it was noticed that while it's not positive, um, and that it, while it is positive that it reinforces, inf reinforces the importance of protection and promotion of breastfeeding, uh, it had been weakened from the initial proposal. Um, references were made to supporting implementation of the WHO Code of Marketing for Infant Formula. Um, references that were made, sorry, to, to those two um, pieces of guidance were weakened or removed entirely, which is obviously especially concerning given the importance of breastfeeding, particularly in low- and middle-income countries, um, for reducing NCD risk, but also um, providing uh, protection from um, infections in early life. Next slide, please. Um, and finally, on rheumatic fever and rheumatic heart disease, uh, member states noticed the disproportionate impact um, of RHD on vulnerable populations, especially including women, children, and indigenous people. Uh, New Zealand referred to, to island populations in addition. Um, there is recognition that RHD is inextricably linked to social determinants of health and that the need to address it is aligned with the priorities of the GPW13 to promote the health, serve the vulnerable, and achieve health equity, um, as well as synergies with other NCDs. Um, there's a need for a cross-departmental approach within WHO and also a whole-of-society approach that includes communities. And there's a need um, and it was noted that um, the interventions to address RHD are both simple and cost-effective. Um, the resolution contains a, a vast number of, of actions, including five for member states, three for international stakeholders, and five for the WHO DG. Um, and yeah, the main thing probably to flag is that there will be a report on the extent of the burden and nature of RHD uh, submitted to the 74th World Health Assembly and this, um, the, the lack of knowledge of the burden of RHD and accurate information was noted um, both prior to the World Health Assembly and in member state statements itself. Uh, and I think now if we move on to questions and answers. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that was flagged, thank you, Stephen, is does NCDA have access to the details of the budget for the GPW? Um, Stephen, so the, the budget for the GPW is more detailed than it has been in previous years. The NCDs are just included as um, one of the NCDs come under the, the core priorities, I think they're referred to in the budget, um, whereas 
there there are other budgets, one for health emergencies and then one other special budget, but NCDs are bundled in with everything else, so we don't have access to detailed data um, in, in the budget. Um, but it's worth noting for others on the call that not all of the information on the GPW was posted on the WHA page. There is a dedicated web page elsewhere on WHO's website on the GPW, um, including expert guidance and a, a more detailed indicator framework. So strongly encourage people who are interested to, to seek out that specific web page. Um, I don't think we, oh, and Stephen, I'll include a link to that specific web page when we post the slides online. That would be helpful indeed. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to George, who's kindly on the line from the European Public Health Alliance. Thank you, George. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you, Jess. Um, my name is uh, George Stelly. As I said, I'm a policy officer with the European Public Health Alliance, and I've been asked to talk today about EFA's recent work on on trade and public health, uh, particularly around the EU's trade negotiations with Latin American countries. So that's specifically um, a deal with Mexico, a deal with Chile, and a deal with the the Mercosur trade bloc, which includes um, Argentina, Brazil, Uruguay and Paraguay. Um, so IFA published a paper on this in, in May, um, which you can see the front cover of there, uh, and it's available on our website uh, for more details. Um, I'm going to go over the main points uh, in this presentation, but obviously all the references and details are in the paper, so do seek that out if you're interested. Um, it covers nine areas, uh, identifying the risks for, for these nine areas from the deals. Uh, so it covers tobacco, food, alcohol, uh, antimicrobial resistance, access to medicines, labeling and procurement issues, uh, investment and investment protection, uh, and health sustainability and uh, impact assessments, uh, and gives, gives each of these areas a sort of risk uh, score for how likely they are to be uh, impacted by the deals or how seriously they will be impacted by the deals. So just to give you a little summary of what I'm going to cover today, um, I'll start off by giving some context uh, on health and trade, and particularly with uh, Latin American countries. And then I'll look at tobacco and, uh, and unhealthy food, uh, food that's high in fat, salt, and sugar. Uh, then I'll move on to meat and, and AMR issues. And then lastly, uh, looking at more sort of governance issues around transparency and impact assessment of the deals. So to give uh, some context, uh, health in Latin America has already been substantially impacted by previous trade deals in the past. So uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement had big impacts in Mexico, and um, the deal between uh, Central America and, and uh, the United States, uh, the CAFTA, also had uh, similar impacts on health. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, a nutrition transition has been, uh, been observed in these countries where there's an influx of, of Western-style foods and uh, energy-dense, nutrient-poor foods uh, in markets that were previously fairly, uh, fairly protected. Uh, a second point to, to give the context is that um, corporations and, and industry interests have already uh, targeted health-protecting legislation in these countries uh, through investor-state uh, dispute settlement mechanisms. So, for example, uh, Philip Morris, uh, International sued uh, Uruguay over its tobacco control legislation, which it uh, implemented under the under the uh, Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And uh, PMI actually did that through a, an investment treaty that Uruguay had made with Switzerland. Uh, and uh, Philip Morris claimed that uh, the Uruguay the Uruguayan law went far beyond any reasonable public health goal. And it also said that uh, plain packaging laws were indirect expropriation of its uh, trademarks. So we can see that, uh, that the big, big industries are more than willing to use uh, trade and investment deals to, to challenge health legislation if they get the chance. Um, and lastly, the context in, in Latin American countries and uh, in all the countries with which the EU is negotiating is that uh, tobacco, alcohol, and drug use uh, along with unhealthy diet, uh, are among the top five health risks in all of those countries, uh, and Mexico, uh, in all the Mercosur countries, and Mexico and Chile as well, uh, according to the Global Burden of Disease study. 
So firstly, um, the most shocking thing that we, that we uh, brought to light, I mean, it was already public, but that we, uh, we highlighted was that uh, tobacco has been included as an offensive interest, as you can see uh, in, this, in this document, uh, for the Mercosur negotiations. So essentially this means that the EU wants to, uh, to push tobacco through this negotiation in order to, to bring economic gain to, to European countries. Um, it doesn't really specify how it thinks this would happen or, or what would be offensive about the interest, but we can assume that it would want to reduce tariffs. It might want to target uh, non-tariff barriers, so that's legislation, tobacco control legislation that would affect the profitability of European tobacco uh, companies and to enable them to invest more in Latin American countries as well. So it's uh, quite serious, and uh, we wrote to the, the European Commission about this uh, although the response has been less than uh, satisfactory so far, but um, I can answer questions about that uh, later. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, tobacco has been explicitly listed as an EU offensive interest in, uh, in the negotiations with the Mercosur, which is, uh, which is problematic. Uh, more broadly, looking at, at food, unhealthy food, um, lowered tariffs and increased uh, foreign direct investment, that's FDI, could make uh, high fat, sugar or salt food and drink more accessible. So as I said, we've already observed uh, a nutrition transition, in, a nutrition transition in some of these uh, developing countries when they're, uh, when they just after they've negotiated uh, liberalizing trade deals with uh, more developed countries. Um, there's also a worry that the EU's l proposed wording for, for labeling schemes could threaten particularly Chile's uh, black, black stop sign labels. Um, so the, the EU text only states that information relevant to consumers uh, should be required. Um, and of course, this doesn't explicitly uh, target the, the sort of health promoting labels as we saw the US trying to do uh, in its renegotiation of NAFTA. But by, by having such a vague um, provision, only information relevant to consumers can be, can be required. Um, opens the door to, uh, to challenge or debate. And um, if, uh, if big food companies can see, see an opportunity to use these trade deals to undermine uh, labeling schemes that they think will challenge their profitability, then, then we, can, we can expect that they will. And uh, this sort of wording that is, is sufficiently unclear on the, the public health benefits uh, opens the door to that, that challenge. So we see that as an issue. Uh, and last, lastly, uh, one of the few... Uh, health impacts for the EU. In fact, most of the impacts we found were, uh, were on the Latin American side, uh, is that uh, the deal with Mercosur particularly could increase sugar imports to the EU, um, making it more likely that it, it might be used in, in products more than, more than necessary. Or uh, it could increase EU production of isoglucose based on imported maize and, and wheat starch from those countries. Um, that's a risk we identified. Next, on um, meat and antimicrobial resistance issues, um, Brazil and Argentina are, are big uh, beef and, and soy uh, producers, which means uh, in the negotiations with Mercosur uh, and the EU, it's been a big interest of, uh, of Mercosur to, to get more access to EU markets for, their, for their, their meat exports. So there's a concern that an increased import of, of meat and, uh, from, from Mercosur countries could increase EU consumption of red meat uh, and result in environmental health issues on the, in the production side. There are also some fa food uh, safety issues um, in the leaked uh, food safety chapter, the, the sanitary and phytosanitary chapter. Uh, the proposals uh, from the EU side uh, proposed only having a single physical import check on exports of, of meat, um, which is, is problematic particularly given uh, that there's been recent meat scandals in, in Brazilian, Brazilian factories and Brazilian production, uh, some examples of, of rotten meat being, uh, being approved to, for export. And so um, it seems strange that, uh, <laughs> that the EU would want to minimize the, uh, <clears throat> the checks on these exports in this context. Um, there are some, uh, some commitments on antimicrobial resistance uh, and even a proposal to include a chapter, but these are fairly weak commitments uh, about cooperation and, and uh, sort of best practice sharing and this sort of thing, uh, which, yeah, which are, are 
fairly weak by comparison, and, and whatever is um, whatever is uh, included uh, it could be undermined by the more substantive legal parts of the, the SPS chapter. So that's an issue that we see. Um, and lastly, on the more the more governance issues, um, we've seen the transparency chapters in, in these deals, which tend to promote and facilitate industry involvement in the uh, in the process of, of decision making and uh, of, of, of regulation, um, which can be problematic, of course. And on the side of the impact assessment, uh, the EU is obliged to conduct uh, sustainability impact assessments of all free trade agreements. Um, in order to, to identify the, the potential impacts for, for uh, the environment and for labor, and uh, some of them more recently have been also looking at health issues, which we've uh, advocated for. But um, we see that the timelines between the, the actual trade negotiations and the impact assessment are completely, uh, completely off. So for example, uh, the EU agreed uh, an, agreed its deal with uh, Mexico at the end of at the end of April, but the uh, sustainability impact assessment is not expected to be published until later this year. Uh, Mercosur is, is similar; the, the sustainability, sustainability impact assessment still isn't finished. But um, EU leaders and, and uh, Brazilian and Argentinian leaders have been uh, talking about a final agreement since uh, late last year, late 2017, although it hasn't happened yet. So we can see that um, these deals can't possibly have a, these, these impact assessments rather, can't possibly have an impact on, on the final shape of the deal if uh, they're only concluded months uh, after the deals are, are already wrapped up. So we can see that um, they're being used mostly as a window dressing and to, to make it look like the, <laughs> the EU is, is doing its job properly and uh, Keep people like us quiet, but not really having any impact on negotiations, which uh, is quite problematic. Um, yeah. So those were the main issues I wanted to, to highlight. Uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions uh, if uh, if there are any. Otherwise, uh, I'll pass it back to uh, the next speaker. Thanks ever so ever so much, George. I, trade is something that I think everybody in the NCD community is, is conscious of the impact of, but it's difficult for us to to get into the nitty gritty. So thank you for demystifying everything. Um, That's okay. I was really struck helpful. by what you said about Chile. Very, very much so. I'm really struck by what you said about um, the front of pack labelling in, in Chile and how this could be impacted. It's definitely something that we've celebrated um, and that's been something that the nutrition community has used as a really positive example. So. Thank yeah. you for that. Um, you mentioned that the response from the European Commission has been less than satisfactory. Um, could you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, yes, I can. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, um, we wrote to the, uh, the European Trade Commissioner, Cecilia Malmström, along with uh, her health uh, counterpart, uh, Vitenis Andrukaitis, uh, along with um, some Latin American uh, and, and uh, Latin American NCD organizations the Campaign for Tobacco for Kids and with uh, the NCD Alliance as well, um, particularly focusing on the tobacco issue and calling on them to, to drop uh, tobacco as an offensive interest from all its trade deals, to exclude tobacco lobbyists from, from trade policy, and to, uh, to, on that last point I just mentioned, to strengthen the impact assessment process. And so we sent this letter to the commissioners in mid-May and at the end of May, I attended a, a sort of uh, a stakeholder uh, a civil society dialogue meeting where Commissioner Malmstrom was there to answer everybody's questions. And uh, I, I referred, to, uh, referred to our letter and, and said, I'm sure we'll be getting an answer from you soon, um, sort of thing. And she responded saying um, that our, our report wasn't a scoop. Uh, she, she knew we thought we had a scoop, but that it wasn't wasn't important and that it was entirely normal to uh, include tobacco in this way uh, and that uh, tobacco is uh, just an agricultural product like any other and they, they won't discriminate between them, um, which we found quite shocking. <laughs> and I think um, when my colleague, when uh, our Director General, uh, our Secretary General rather, put this to uh, the Health Commissioner, uh, he, was, he was clear that uh, they don't see tobacco as, as just like any other agricultural uh, product. So. 
hopefully there's going to be uh, continued dialogue and <laughs> some fairly strong lobbying from the, the health arm of the commission in the in the trade one but um yeah really what we've been seeing is is this complete incoherence between uh, the, the the health directorate general of the commission's uh, approach on tobacco and uh, the rest of the commission uh, and so we're we're following this up and uh, maybe more on this in the future but yeah not very Thank satisfactory you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I know that yeah trade is definitely something that a lot of people in the entity community would like to be more involved in and I don't know if, if trade policy is different but there may be other health policies in that a lot of um, international health policy we can understand through engaging with um, world health assemblies and other WHO processes. But for trade, it strikes me as being slightly different. And my understanding is that often we wouldn't be able to view text until a lot of the, a lot of the details have already been finalized. And I wondered how you as EFA manage that, or if I've understood correctly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a fair point, definitely. I think um, trade can be very technical. Uh, it can seem very complicated, and, and obviously it's got its its whole language of its own. And um, yeah, it's it's another thing for a lot of health, uh, public health uh, uh, campaigners and, and organisations to engage with, and it, it seems too distant. So I think uh, yeah, you have that sort of cultural divide issue. Um, I mean, the reason that EFA works on uh, on trade policy is because trade is a um, trade is a European competence, and a lot of our members. Uh, at national level, uh, don't have time to to work on trade, so so we take on that first because it makes sense to tackle it at the European level. In terms of um, how we engage with it, it's true. Uh, transparency and lack of transparency, uh, to be more precise, does have um, a considerable impact on 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 what we can know about the deals and and how we can raise issues earlier on. Um, Thankfully, there is a, a good, strong group of, of either trade-focused organizations or environmental or labor-focused uh, NGOs who, who also work on trade. Um, so a lot of the leaks for, for Mercosur, which is where we, we found some of these more concerning passages and for, for Chile and for Mexico as well, uh, came from, from Greenpeace. In fact, Greenpeace uh, did a, a number of, of leaks of, of negotiating documents. Um, yeah, so that that's some of our sources for for these concerns. Um, but of course, I mean the lack of transparency in itself, and uh, the lack of impact that the sustainability impact assessments have is also problematic. I mean, there's one thing is the timeline, but also if the people doing the the impact assessment don't have any access to uh, to to the text themselves, then they they can't assess the the potential risks at all. Um, so yeah, that is a problem, and that's a concern that lots of people are campaigning on to get these to be more transparent and have a better governance structure around them. But yeah. Thank you. And then there were two questions that came in on the chat, and the first one is from Komlan Tosu from Togo, um, and he asks: um, So in um, in our countries, which I guess refers to, to West Africa or maybe Africa more widely, it's probably applicable for both and indeed wider in the world. Um, fertilizers are abusively used in, in agriculture, and if you've got any specific recommendations for, for that part of the world or more widely, um, I think that might be slightly outside your your scope. And if it is, then we can follow up with Comlin after the webinar. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. It is slightly outside our scope. Uh, as, as Aoife, we, we work on food and, and agriculture issues, but we more work on uh, on dietary health, on on NCDs, and um, and environmental health issues. So we don't tend to consider fertilizers and uh, pesticides. Um, there is uh, an organisation in Brussels, sort of a sister organisation to EFA, called the the Health and Environment Alliance, who work on on chemicals and, and chemicals around food. So they might have some more uh, useful recommendations on on fertilizers. Uh, but yeah, I'm sorry, I can't help on that comment. Not at all. And, and one other thing to mention, Conlon, is that there's a, a report um, by the UN Special Rapporteur on the right to food on pesticides that um, I think it's from about 18 months ago. But I'll share the link for that as well because that definitely contained um, some specific issues and, and recommendations. Um, and then the other question that came in online is from Bill Jeffrey um, asking if it was possible um, when you were preparing your analyses, George, um, to consider um, the 
estimates from the global burden of disease um, in predicting what the most important um, food labeling information might be, given that um, white bread has um, health-harming ingredients as well as health-promoting ingredients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. I, I have to be honest and say I didn't drill down that far into the um, the global burden disease uh, estimates uh, for the various aspects of the diet. I mean, what we really did, uh, what our concern comes from on the labeling was was that that quote I mentioned from the uh, the EU proposal uh, that only information relevant to consumers should be required. Um, so yeah, it's it's less about what get la what gets labelled and what labelling is on there, but more that I suppose this is perhaps one of the issues why health campaigners find it harder to engage with trade um, policy is because very often it's a it's a defensive area for us. It's uh, we're just trying to make sure that uh, <laughs> that uh, trade deals don't give um, yeah don't give uh, companies or, or, or lobbies uh, another way to challenge. Uh, health promoting, uh, health protecting legislation, um, and so far we've we've uh, observed that yeah, the uh, companies can can make use of of uh, of trade um, of trade provisions to to challenge those things. So really, we're trying to we're trying to minimise the risk from trade deals rather than trying to really promote anything <laughs> uh, that we might like to see, but more to protect what already exists. So. Um, yeah, I don't feel I can give you any information on on um, on the various aspects of, of of the diet and what should be included on food labels. But uh, yeah. No, thanks for that. That that was useful as it was. Um, can I ask one final question? And I'm sorry if you covered it and I missed it earlier. Um, but I know that when NCDA started engaging with EFA on this, I didn't understand the difference between offensive and defensive trade interests. Um, did you cover that already, or would it be helpful to explain it for anyone on the phone that's not? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the, the end of your question. Um, sorry, the difference between offensive and defensive trade interests. Um, yes. That, that was new terminology for me, and I don't know if you covered it already. Uh, no, I, I mentioned offensive interests, but um, yes. Um, yeah, again, this is an example of the very trade-centric uh, lingo um, language. Um, so essentially, an offensive interest for the EU is something that uh, the EU expects to make economic gains from. So, uh, so tobacco was one. It expects that it will be able to sell uh, a lot of um, a lot of tobacco or a lot of cigarettes, uh, tobacco products in Mercosur countries. Whereas a defensive interest for the EU would be something that uh, it's trying to protect its domestic industry from uh, from imports from from the negotiating partners. So in this in this case, with Mercosur, the big example would be beef. So, um, as I said, Brazil and Argentina are big beef producers, and a lot of the dialogue around uh, around the Mercosur deal has been uh, Irish and French uh, cattle farmers, beef producers, saying uh, you have to protect us from from these cheap imports of of low quality Brazilian Argentinian beef because you know French and and Irish. Uh, beef is much more high quality, and Brexit's going to happen, and we'll lose all this trade, and so on. So it's really just a, a very um, black and white view where if we can sell it to them, it's an offensive interest. If they're going to sell lots of it to us and threaten our our industry, our, our producers, then it's a def defensive interest, and we'll try and minimize that. So a trade negotiation is, is a big a big collection of of compromises, you know, uh, the EU is trying to push its thing, but it's also trying to prevent Mercosur from pushing pushing all their things. Um, and in the end, they they end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, you know, another example would be with Japan. The uh, dairy was a, an, an offensive interest for uh, the EU to Japan because Japan doesn't really have any dairy industry, uh, and for Japan, it's sort of um, cars and this sort of thing. Uh, yeah, so it's really uh, it's it's the balance between protecting your domestic industry and supporting your your exporting industry who could benefit from the deal. Thank you very 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 much, George. Um, okay. I think there are no more questions, so we will pass on to Priya, who's going to update us on preparations for the UN high level meeting on NCDs. Thanks very much, Jess. So there's quite a lot happening now in New York, and 
the next few months until September, which is, which is fast approaching. So I'll go over a few of the um, recent updates. Next slide, please. So the first thing is that the proposed draft elements paper for the outcome of the high-level meeting on NCDs is now online. Um, the link will be live again once we post the slides on our website later today or by tomorrow morning. Um, and it was presented to member states on last Thursday in New York. Um, one of the things to note is that it is a political declaration, which is really the strongest outcome that we can get, um, which is uh, really reflective of the desire to have heads of state and government at the high-level meeting and signing off on this agreement for, for high-level political action. And the title is Time to Deliver. Um, some of you might notice that from the high-level commission. Uh, commission's report um, looking at accelerating our response to address NCDs for the health and well-being of present and future generations. And I should note that this is entirely draft. That title may change following um, member state uh, feedback. So there are a lot of things to like and to welcome in this draft elements paper, language on health as a human right, addressing digital and M health as, as a technology that can help advance the NCD response addressing childhood obesity, inclusion of mental health, um, and integration of mental health throughout uh, the NCD response, looking at universal health coverage, access to treatment and care, um, involvement of civil society and people living with NCDs, also um, private sector engagement, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, accountability for NCDs, uh, financing. Um, there's language on fiscal policies. Of course, we know that's, that's definitely um, going to be a contentious issue. And also calls for a review at the UN on, in 2025. And so member states want a concise political document, again, because this is going to be a political declaration. It's not technical. They do not want to reopen any of the technical aspects agreed by WHO. And that's really a reflection of the fact that New York, as we know, is not a health-focused um, area. Um, space, member states are not technical experts. And, and the whole real impetus for having this high-level meeting in New York and having the outcome negotiated in New York is to have a political document that really pushes those technical commitments into action at the highest level. So the first informal negotiations will take place in about two weeks on Friday, the 29th of June in New York. And that's really where member states will express their, their initial feedback on this draft, um, things that they want to see strengthened or, and things that, they've been remo uh, that they would like to have removed um, or added. So we know, you know lines in the sand are very much drawn. We have a good idea of how and which governments will negotiate on things like fiscal policies, regulation of industries, um, engagement of the private sector um, under the whole umbrella of public-private partnerships, et cetera. Um, one thing to note that's very interesting in this draft is that there's an entire section um, on commitments for the private sector, and specifically within that private sector, um, the, the industries responsible for, for producing some of those unhealthy commodities um, to take action such as voluntary reformulation, restriction of marketing, et cetera. So um, that's, that's very interesting to see. I think uh, we as, as NCDA and, and civil society will be definitely sharing our feedback on, on these comments. And, and I think it's interesting to have um, recommendations for private sector in a document that is uh, meant to highlight government's commitment. So I expect that there will be some pushback on, on that language. Um, so next step is that NCDA we're conducting an analysis of these draft elements and we'll be sharing that with member states. And we really encourage everyone to share proposed language um, really pulling off of the draft elements paper and as well as any things that are missing. Um, in terms of some of the things that are missing just from this first look of the of the paper, um, there's no mention, while there is a mention 
of, um, of mental health. Actually, there are quite a few mentions of mental health as an integral part of the, of the NCD response. And there's no mention of air pollution as a risk factor for NCDs. Um, there's really language on comorbidities could be strengthened, including comorbidities with tuberculosis. Again, that's particularly relevant because there's a high-level meeting on TB taking place the day prior to NCDs, and it's really a really important opportunity to highlight the linkages and, and comorbidities between TB, diabetes, et cetera. Um, also missing is the gender dimension of, of NCDs um, and some of the links to the other SDGs, so making the point that achieving the NCD and um, NCD-related targets um, is, is really necessary to achieve some of those other SDGs. And so, so more to come in the next few weeks um, once that Friday takes place, the 29th, the first negotiations and discussion on that, on that draft elements paper, we'll have a much better idea of, of how member states will be negotiating. Next slide, please. And as part of the preparatory process for the high-level meeting, and there will be an interactive hearing with all stakeholders on Thursday, the 5th of July. And, and this is an opportunity uh, for civil society and academia, philanthropic foundations, NGOs, medical associations, the private sector, and, and broader communities and stakeholders to engage with member states and share their priorities for the outcome of the high-level meeting. So, um, the list of organizations with special accreditation, so those of you who applied to attend um, the high-level meeting and the hearing is posted online. And registration to attend this 5th of July meeting is now open and closes on uh, next Thursday, the 21st. So each organization can register up to five people as part of its delegation. The concept note for the hearing is now online, and the final program, including speakers, is forthcoming. This is all, again, being organized by the UN. Um, one note, and I know there's, there's been some discussion in, amongst civil society actors and, and, and advocates around the participation around uh, the interactive hearing. Um, this is a UN process and not WHO, so engagement of private sector is very different for UN versus WHO. Um, and it is open to, to everyone, really. Um, so if you look at the list of accredited organizations, and similar to 2011 and the 2014 high-level meetings on NCDs, there are quite a few of, of um, the alcohol industries, food and bev, uh, industries, um, which is nothing new. Again, they have been present before, and, and they will be present at, at this meeting as well. And so back to the, the concept note for the, for the hearing, there are four panels, um, and the themes are around scaling up action for the MCD response, so looking at some of the prioritization of interventions according to country context and, and need, um, so looking at the best buys and towards achievement of universal health coverage. There's one on financing, one on multi-sectoral partnerships, and then a final one on political leadership and accountability. So there will be opening and closing sessions, and then those four multi-stakeholder panels. It will be a one-day meeting in, in July. Um, following each panel, um, each of the panelists' remarks, there will be an interactive Q&A um, segment, uh, which is an opportunity for participants to, to uh, make statements from the floor. Um, and this, there's no pre-registration required. Everyone who is attending has the opportunity to make statements from the floor, um, and the methods for that will be um, discussed for those who are attending. Again, this is an in-person meeting only. It will be live streamed and webcast on the UN's website, but there's no um, virtual participation. And so in advance of this and in preparation, for, for this interactive hearing on the 5th of July, um, NCDA is, is hosting an informal pre-meeting for civil society only on Wednesday, the 4th of July from 1 to 4 p.m. Um, and the address is there. Uh, it will be held in New York again. This will be an in-person meeting for, for those who are in town already for the interactive hearing. And we really want 
see this as an opportunity for, for advocates to share priorities and strategize ahead of the hearing. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's important to note that the timing of this is really good because there will only have been one uh, negotiations meeting of the outcome document, which means that civil society input will be um, taken on and included in the considerations and deliberations around the outcome for the high-level meeting. So um, I think the timing of that is very good. Uh, we expect the outcome document of the, of the HLM to be negotiated and agreed by the end of July. So as you can imagine, July will be quite a busy time in New York with these negotiations uh, taking place. Next slide, please. And finally, um, the WHO's Independent High-Level Commission launched their report um, about a week and a half ago um, in Geneva. So this was the result of quite a few virtual and in-person meetings and discussions and um, on what to include in this report that is meant to deliver some bold recommendations um, for consideration in the, in the outcome of the high-level meeting. So there's six themes, um, overarching themes for these recommendations, including political leadership and responsibility, um, prioritizing and scaling up pre uh, interventions for, for NCDs and mental health, um, looking at NCDs within the health systems uh, and universal health coverage. Um, so looking at health promotion and prevention and control um, within UHC and looking at increasing effective regulation and appropriate engagement with the private sector, academia, civil society, and communities, really trying to build on that whole of society approach to, to NCDs and mental health. And the fifth recommendation is looking at developing a new economic paradigm for funding for, for NCDs and mental health, and finally strengthening accountability. So there were some strengths in the report. Um, high-level leadership, civil society accountability, and it was, it was generally comprehensive, but I think there were, there were some serious weaknesses, again, looking at the, the lack of inclusion of people living with NCDs, addressing the commercial determinants of health, the fiscal policies, so taxation of sugar, tobacco, and alcohol. Um, and one point that I, I didn't mention earlier was that the opening message from the co-chairs of this uh, of this report, um, there is a mention in there that there were quite a few divergence and diverse views among commissioners, and so there was no consensus on taxation of sugar-sweetened beverages and private sector accountability, even though many of the commissioners supported including um, those points. So in, respo in response, excuse me, NCDA together with over 200 organizations produced a civil society statement um, calling out really five points um, that the commission should have strengthened or included in their report. And these five points were looking at putting people first and meaningfully involving people living with NCDs and young people in the NCD and mental health response, calling out the commercial determinants of health as a major obstacle to progress and, and highlighting some of the ways that these commercial determinant industries um, infiltrates public health, uh, adopting a comprehensive approach to stacks, again, sugar, tobacco, and alcohol taxation. The fourth was tackling NCD risk factors in a comprehensive manner, ensuring not to overlook alcohol control and physical activity. And finally, maintaining a balanced approach to prevention and treatment, including palliative care. So the Commission is now exploring a, the second phase of its work. Um, they will be releasing some potential uh, ways to take forward their work um, through to the HLM and perhaps even beyond. And we have heard that this will be shared online um, perhaps by the end of the month. Um, so more to come there. And I will uh, pause there for any questions. Thank you, Priya. Um, there's a question that's come in from Grace um, asking that you know, at, at the interactive hearing, who will be able to make statements? Um, and for those not able to be there in person, is somebody else able to read statements? Yes, so thanks very much. Um, 
So as I mentioned, it, everyone who is there in person is able to make statements. It will be first come, first served based on the available time to make statements or ask questions. And, and for those who are not present, I would suggest contacting others who, who may be attending and asking if they would be willing to include some of that language um, that you would like heard as part of their intervention. Again, these interventions will most likely be kept very brief to allow them the uh, maximum number of people to speak and share their views. Thanks, Priya. And then question from Rosie at UICC on whether we'll be sharing a copy of the analysis of the draft elements for the political declaration um, because it would be helpful to align. Yes, definitely. Um, we are in the process of finalizing that, and it'll be ready next week for for sharing with member states. Um, NCDA will be sharing it with member states in New York and in Geneva, as well with our uh, as well as with our network. Um, so, so really emphasizing that member states, um, if you if you take a look at the uh, draft political declaration, they're not looking to have any more. And national time-bound commitments, again, because this is going to be a high-level political declaration looking at taking forward um, and really accelerating the response um, at the highest level. And so it's unlikely that there's really any appetite um, from member states in New York to include any more commitments. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention is that we have heard some talk that perhaps the high-level meeting would include reference to the 5x5, five five, so really expanding to officially include mental health and, and air pollution when we talk about the 4x4+. Four four um, we're not seeing that, which is actually quite, really not quite surprising, again, because New York is not a technical space. Um, member states here will wait to see what WHO does in Geneva around expanding the 4x4 four four to the 5x5 five five before they, they bring that to New York. Um, so even though there's not language specifically on a 5x5 five five approach, there is, again, as I mentioned, a really um, strong integration that we're seeing of mental health and the response, and we as NCDA will be uh, suggesting and recommending that air pollution is also included as a risk factor. Thanks, Priya. And then one other question from Grace, sorry, that came before the other one. Um, on if um, an organization wishes to make a statement on steps that can be taken in relation to a particular disease area um, to support the wider NCD response um, and the reduction of mortality, um, what's the best way to position um, a statement on a particular disease? Um, I get, uh, sorry, I guess right, if it's a public statement at the hearing, again, the measures that I, I mentioned before, if you're not going to be attending in person, finding someone who is and sharing specific language, if it's a public statement outside of the hearing, drafting a statement, um, sharing it on social media, emailing it to member states um, in country and in New York and Geneva and, and um, um, and with other contacts there. Again, there, in New York right now, there's a lot of discuss discussion um, on an integrated approach to health. Again, it's, it's really important to be positioning ourselves as, um, as working across silos, um, looking at the horizontal approach to health, life course approach. Um, again, there, there will be a high-level meeting on universal health coverage next year um, in 2019 in New York. So there's a lot of discussion amongst member states of how the high-level meeting on NCDs and also the high-level meeting on TB, how does that and lead towards this meeting on universal health coverage. So in New York, all of the co-facilitators for these various processes are discussing and meeting and, and really trying to make sure that um, these different issues are complementary. Thanks, Freya. And I guess something uh, just to add, um, Grace, um, I think if um, you can identify where the links are between a specific disease and the wider NCD response, um, whether that's to do with um, specific risk factors or um, maybe reference to comorbidities, then I think that would be useful to, to bring out in a statement. Um, anything that NCDA does is always um, um, NCD-wide, um, but for anyone that wants to make a statement on something specific, I think that, that would be useful to recommend. Um, I think there are no more questions. Um, for that. So thank you very much again, Priya. And we will move on now to updates from Lucy on the Enough campaign. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you, Jeff.
Uh, hello, everybody, and uh, good to speak with you all today, whatever time of the day it is, um, where you are. Next slide, please. So the first update, I'd like to bring you about the Enough campaign that we're running in the lead up to the high level meeting. Is We had a terrific on the ground launch in Geneva during the Walk the Talk Health for All Challenge that WHO put on for the first time. Uh, the motto for our team was together we're stronger and together we can beat NCDs. And we had over 100 people come and, and join the team donning the Enough t-shirts and I've since seen them used um, in other places around the world as well to, to support the Enough messaging and specific local campaigns. So that's been brilliant to see. Uh, we had uh, quite a few higher profile people come along and, and say hello including Dr Tedros and uh, Chris Tufton, um, Minister of Health from Jamaica and uh, Princess Dina Merritt also popped by. So there were quite a lot of people who, uh, who came to say hello, came to walk with us and came to, to join in the message and it was really lovely to have the support of all of you who were there and, uh, and all who engaged both online and offline. Next slide please. So uh, WHO was, uh, sorry, WHA was an important time for the Enough NCDs campaign because it was uh, obviously an opportunity to really get the Enough messaging and advocacy messaging out to a big global audience by linking it up to the World Health Assembly um, hashtag and messaging on social media. And we successfully managed to do that and uh, NCDs was among the top. Uh, associated hashtags throughout the World Health Assembly. Enough NCDs was up there as well as was Beat NCDs. So there was a lot of resonance of NCDs and it was really, really positive to see so much, um, so much conversation around NCDs both on the ground and online and uh, a lot of people recognising the Enough campaign and identifying with the frustration but also the need to really mobilise and act around it. Next slide please. So uh, the next uh, part of my update is about our enoughncds.com website which is a bit of a portal that is very specific to the Enough campaign. Um, I've showed you parts of it previously so I'm going to focus in on a couple of new features that have been added to it. The first one is part of the Take Action section and as you can see there I've just shown a little bit of what's within each of those Take Action sections. There's lots of suggestions and ideas for what you can do to get involved in Enough. Uh, there's also a new pledge button and anybody everywhere can participate in the pledge. It is to connect with one of the campaign priorities or several of them or say what you specifically pledge to do to take action and move forward the NCD agenda. So we encourage everyone to participate in that. Next slide please. And pledges will also be added to this new map of impact that we've got live. And the map of impact has been designed to show where people are making pledges around the world, to show where people are doing activities and events around the world, uh, and also add resources and news uh, about whatever's happening that's enough related. Um, and we encourage you again to submit things. We've had a few submissions already um, from different uh, organisations from different pledges and um, Healthy India Alliance's Walk the Talk activities were also added in there. Uh, so we encourage everybody to, to participate and let's show that this is really a global movement. It's not just happening in one big city like New York or London. Uh, it's happening everywhere. NCDs are a challenge for everyone and we want to show that we're all raising our voices about that. Next slide please. Speaking of raising our voices, uh, tomorrow is the Digital Activation Day on social media and we have a thunderclap that will be going live at midday UK time. There's still time to sign up and thank you to everybody who already has. We've got over 280 um, social media accounts that have, have clicked in to participate in the thunderclap. It's a very easy thing to do and only takes a couple of minutes and a couple of clicks to link your social media account to it. Um, and at the moment it looks like the, the thunderclap and the message about having enough of uh, inaction on NCDs will go out to around about 2 million people. So that's exceptional reach for, for our campaign and the message. 
you don't just have to use the thunderclap though. There are other ideas and um, we have a news item on our website and the enoughncds.com website as well which gives some, some pointers including some links to images that you can use to share, suggestions for messages that you could use um, and other, other opportunities to engage in some online digital rally, I suppose you could call it, uh, online tomorrow. Next slide please. I do want to remind you all if you are talking about enough to use the hashtag enough NCDs, hashtag enough NCDs. Um, it helps us to track it and also to amplify everything that is being said if it's, uh, if it's aligned with what these priorities are that we've all agreed on. Um, but the next exciting development is that we have um, we've decided to harmonise and, and unify around a global week for action on NCDs which would be the first week of September from the 3rd till the 9th of September. It's an opportunity for everyone everywhere to come together and say enough but also to celebrate the progress and leadership that we're seeing and try to call on governments uh, not just to attend the high level meeting and, and uh, come true to their commitments but to really follow through and, and to participate in, in the movement around NCDs and to show some examples of what's, what's doing, been done well and what could be done better. Um, the idea with the week is that we're not being prescriptive about what people do. You can do whatever works for you and your environment um, and your context. So be it holding a meeting or a walk or a fun run or a picnic or a meal. Um, there are all sorts of things that can be, can be done and we're looking forward to seeing some creative ideas about what will help uh, raise NCDs on national and regional agendas in advance of the high level meeting only a few weeks out from that. So again, um, stay tuned to enoughncds.com, start planning, uh, share your own ideas with us and unify any promotions around that Enough NCDs hashtag. Next slide please. And finally I just wanted to point to our resources for the Enough campaign. Uh, it's constantly being updated with different reports, uh, logos, files, anything that organisations have been developing that, that may be relevant and inspirational to other organisations. Um, we've also got a couple of new videos that we have up on our YouTube channel. So again, please explore the, the Enough NCDs website and uh, various social media channels to find, to find what you can uh, make the most of there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, just one question that, that's come in so far, um, again from Grace, um, asking what the obligations are um, if you sign up for the Sunday Club. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jess, and thanks, Grace. Uh, so there are actually no real obligations. You. Um, you activate a connection between the, the, the Thunderclap system and your social media account and it will post a one-time message that happens at exactly the same, same time as whoever else has signed up to the Thunderclap. Um, and there is no further subscription so you, you shouldn't be spammed by, uh, by Thunderclap or anybody else. Uh, and it's basically an opportunity to make lots of noise all at once and then if we can build on that to, to be um, active around the enough messaging and around our advocacy messaging, then it's a great chance to build on that and continue to make some noise and maybe get enough NCDs trending. Thanks Lucy. Um, that's it for questions for now then. So with the final 15 minutes that we've got left, if we move on to Christina to present on Now Views Our Voices. Thanks Christina. Hi everyone and uh, good morning, good afternoon or good evening uh, depending on where you are in, in the world. It's great to be able to, to speak today on this webinar about, so just to give you an update of where we are with the Our Views, Our Voices initiative. Uh, next slide please. So the Our Views, Our Voices um, initiative, as you know, is an initiative that, um, that spans uh, 2016 to 2020. Um, this work is embedded in the NCD Alliance's strategic plan. This initiative is about promoting the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs in the NCD response. It's looking at equipping people living with NCDs with the skills, knowledge, and, and opportunities to be active players in the NCD response, um, influencing policy and breaking down stigma and discrimination. Um, the initiative has um, different pillars. It is 
um, it is strongly based on the principle of, 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 of consultation, so uh, really keeping tabs with the um, of what, what the challenges are being faced by people living with NCDs, what their recommendations are. Um, if you if you recall, uh, and I say this because m many many of you were were involved in this uh, large consultation push that we had last year. Um, we consulted with um, approximately 2,000 people living with NCDs from across the world uh, to understand how they wanted to be uh, meaningfully involved, challenges faced, and the, what recommendations they had of, of decision makers. Um, and so the principle of consultation is something that really, um, really is at the heart of the, of, of the initiative. The initiative is guided by a, a global advisory committee, uh, which of course includes people living with NCDs themselves. Um, the initiative uh, resonating with the, the NCD Alliance itself has a very strong pillar on advocacy. Um, we're looking at promoting the views and the voices of people living with NCDs to drive change. Um, as a result of the consultation last year, we produced an advocacy agenda of people living with NCDs. This is a fantastic resource document, and really it's a compass for the, the NCD movement. It crystallizes those asks of decision makers from people living with NCDs. It was put together by people living with NCDs, so it is, it's written in the first person. It's an incredibly powerful um, document. So we're, we're looking at promoting this at, at all levels, national, regional, and global levels. The initiative, of course, is about um, really equipping individuals with the, the, the knowledge and skills to, to be active players, to, to be supported, to, to take part, and about really advocating and pushing for those platforms and opportunities and spaces for people living with NCDs. And so from this meaningful involvement side of things, we're obviously looking at having very strong involvement of people living with NCDs in advocacy efforts, for instance, towards the 2018 UN high-level meeting, but also making sure that all of these global processes where policies are being discussed, where political declarations will be, will be emerging, action plans, and so on, um, all of this is something that has to to happen with the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs. These decisions obviously directly affect, uh, affect millions of people across the world, and so we need to make sure that obviously these are, um, that these are reflecting their, their needs and views. And finally, the Our Views, Our Voices initiative also has a strong uh, communications component, really about kind of magnifying those, those voices of, of people living with, with NCDs and trying to challenge those myths and misconceptions and breaking down stigma and discrimination. So I said earlier, this is something that kind of spans the duration of our uh, strategic plan. Next slide, please. Okay, so I wanted to, to just um, update you on, um, on we, we basically developed the, the Our Views, Our Voices training, and uh, we, we piloted this um, just now in, in May, just preceding the World Health Assembly. So this took part on the 17th and 18th of of May, um, and you can see the individuals that that took part there. Next slide, please. And so to to highlight, we we competitively selected uh, people living with NCDs from from across the world. We brought together 19 individuals living with a, a, a range of different of different um, NCDs, representing that vibrant and diverse NCD community from 13 different countries. Um, we were able to bring advocates from Kenya and Ghana through our partnership with Access Accelerated, um, and we were also able to present on uh, some research that we're doing at the moment on meaningful, meaningful involvement, um, thanks to our partnership with Medtronic Foundation. But to highlight here, this, this training was uh, of particularly important to us because basically this is a training that has been developed with people living with NCDs in mind, and the purpose of, of this is to provide a training on being an effective spokesperson and advocate. The training is designed on how to use and leverage the lived experience to build a public narrative. Um, and so this is based on Marshall Gann's theory, which basically um, which basically goes from the individual, the individual lived experience, to the collective, to calling for change. So directly linking the individual experience with a move towards change and advocating um, and advocating um, to, 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 uh, on NCD prevention control in, in this case. 
Um, so we were really looking at um, strengthening communications, community mobilization skills, uh, public speaking, uh, having uh, really looking at uh, uh, training individuals so that there's a cadre of individuals that uh, are comfortable uh, speaking publicly, bringing their lived experience to call for change. The, the training was also looking at making sure that individuals were becoming familiar with the UN high-level meeting and advocacy opportunities, um, increasing knowledge on, on forms of meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs, and really looking at, um, at resulting in uh, each individual to have a menu of actions to take forward the advocacy agenda of people living with NCDs and taking advantage of the UN high-level meeting. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to share that uh, from our kind of pre- and post-evaluation, we could see a percentage increase in, in confidence in reaching out to policymakers to take stronger action on NCDs, in leading others to advocate um, for, um, for a successful UN high-level meeting and in and increased confidence in speaking about NCDs in in public. Um, we were keen to to offer some platforms um, on the margins of the World Health Assembly to 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 really give that opportunity for for some of the people that uh, were taking part in this training to 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 share their views. Um, and so we were we were able to do so in a, a series of uh, different um, events, uh, receptions, and and events. And I have a couple of just just a couple here of many, many, many very powerful quotes. Um, our stories are not unique to us. We're not patients. We are impatient for action on NCDs. This was from Bruno Hellman, um, a very active diabetes advocate from Brazil. And another quote here from Quanele Asante, who um, lives in South Africa. She's on the uh, Global Advisory Committee for Our Views, Our Voices, and she spoke at our um, side event on the Monday night uh, for those that were um, in town and was uh, incredibly powerful in her uh, kind of first-hand uh, perspective um, and really driving home the point of a, a human rights-based approach for, for NCDs. And, and her quote here, we're not statistics, we're human beings with suffering. We must disrupt the existing, disrupt the existing narrative. NCDs are about human rights. Um, so I think this is just really the tip of the iceberg with these, these quotes here. But um, I just wanted to, to share that this is a, a training that we have just uh, piloted, uh, and this is something that we're looking to do uh, more of um, in the future. I have the hashtag here for the Our Views, Our Voices initiative. That is ha hashtag um, NCD Voices. And so if um, you are tweeting about meaningful involvement, about sharing firsthand experiences as they relate to NCDs, we, we encourage you to use this hashtag. Next slide, please. So with, with activities planned for the the rest of the year, it is it is clear to us that the uh, we're we've obviously just just uh, trialed the the training um, on building a public narrative um, and and being a public uh, spokesperson on on NCDs and leveraging the lived experience. So this is something that we're now looking at, really delving into the training strategy for this initiative and particularly looking at how can we expand this this training model. There is um, obviously there are millions of people affected by um, by NCDs and the the advocacy efforts and the NCD response in the different countries across the world would would benefit from that involvement. So how can we uh, expand this this training? So we'll be um, we'll be working on that throughout the course of the year. At the moment we have in our views our, our views our voices group. This was uh, this came together as a as a result of our consultation effort last year. We have just over uh, 200 um, advocates uh, with first-hand experience of, of, of living with with NCDs, and uh, we are uh, promoting different opportunities for meaningful involvement with this with this group. But we're looking at um, how to how to further um, develop um, and um, and mature this this group. We're looking at our views, our voices, resources that can be that can be helpful for people living with NCDs as they um, as they they look for platforms and as they share their views and voices. Um, 
the advocacy agenda of people living with NCDs, as I was saying, is an extremely powerful document. So we're looking at how can we support um, advocates in country with furthering the advocacy agenda. We had a workshop in Nairobi um, in, in March, which was about contextualizing the advocacy agenda of people living with NCDs, um, bringing together people living with NCDs from Kenya to, to, to frame the recommendations from a Kenyan perspective and to, and to discuss which, prior, which uh, recommendations were, were more of a priority for individuals living with NCDs in, in Kenya. This document is available, the advocacy agenda of people living with NCDs. If anyone is interested in contextualizing the agenda or potentially um, translating it to your um, local language, then, then please let us know. We, this, 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 this document is, is for the NCD movement, so please get in touch with us. And then I finally, I wanted to update you on the, I wanted to update you briefly on um, the WHO Global Coordination Mechanism Community of Practice on the Meaningful Involvement of People Living with NCDs. Um, the, the, the WHO global, um, uh, global Coordination Mechanism on NCDs has a series of communities of practice. These are private online networks of individuals. They're password protected. They are spaces that, that promote knowledge exchange between stakeholders. Um, and importantly, discussions get documented in a public repository hosted by the, the WHO. Um, and we felt, um, and um, I, I, I should highlight here, this is a community of practice that is facilitated by the NCD Alliance. It has a, a very strong steering group um, with individuals from, um, from different parts of the world and, and, and organizations with strong networks of people living with, with NCDs. But it's important to us that as we talk about the importance of meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs, that, that some of these discussions actually take place in the WHO space, because we're obviously calling for the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs in UN processes, and of course, the, the WHO being one. Um, uh, UN agency there. So you uh, can expect to, to hear from um, us um, towards the end of this week. This community of practice is getting off the ground this month of June. And so the, the outreach that, that will occur will be to uh, recruit individuals or inviting um, individuals to, to become members of this community of practice. And we're looking to hold our first virtual discussion just before the 5th of July, the interactive hearing, because this is a, a wonderful opportunity to be advocating on the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs. The community of practice will be um, will serve to bring stakeholders together that are interested and, and have a role to play, obviously, in promoting the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs, in discussing and defining what is meant by meaningful involvement, um, exploring what lessons we can learn from other social movements, um, and it's also looking at um, providing a space for uh, discussing advocacy strategies on promoting the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs. So, so these activities that we're looking to, to host just before the interactive hearing really speak to that, uh, capitalizing on an advocacy opportunity at hand. So for those on the webinar that have access to networks of people living with NCDs, please promote the community of practice. Please. For, for the different stakeholders on our, on our um, uh, for the, the different organizations on this webinar as well, the, the different stakeholders can, can obviously play a role in promoting the meaningful involvement of people living with NCDs. So we encourage you to, to, to check out that invitation for membership and to, and to please join us as these discussions uh, will start taking place. Next slide, please. And now just the, just the final uh, slide here. The advocacy agenda and, uh, of people living with NCDs and this work is something that, that really kind of permeates, obviously, the, the, the advocacy work of the NCD Alliance. And I think the Enough Campaign uh, um, is, is, is a prime place for this. And um, the, the Enough Campaign has six different campaign priorities, one of which is putting people first. The advocacy agenda has permeated the different campaign priorities, but this one here is, uh, I just want to highlight this one. This one is, 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 is um, I think, really crystallizes this. This priority is about um, the 
role of civil society. It's about the importance of uh, involving in a meaningful manner people living with NCDs and the NCD response. It's also about youth playing their important role in the NCD response. So as we work um, over the next um, couple of months in influencing the, the outcome document of the high-level meeting, this is a priority that, uh, that is extremely important with this initiative in mind. To highlight the Enough platform, the online platform that Lucy was just sharing, um, has different opportunities for, for engagement. And I wanted to, to just select and highlight one, which is Voices of Change. And this is a place where uh, members of the network, individuals, can add their voice of change. Um, and this is uh, for any, anyone out there to, to, to take advantage and to, and to share what they have had enough of, why action is needed. But I wanted to put an appeal out there for this being a wonderful platform for to hear from the voices of people living with NCDs. We have been, I feel as a community, we have been very strong on the the how, and we know the solutions to to for for um, um, acting on on NCD prevention and control. We have not been so strong on the why. Um, and why this matters, how these uh, these diseases affect affect people, um, and so this is a fantastic platform for people living with NCDs to to share why why this is something that matters to them, and what they would like to see their decision makers do at the UN at the UN high level meeting, and we would be we would be keen to collate these voices of change to take with us. Um, to New York as we campaign on the Enough campaign and call on decision makers to, to put people first. You see there we have a, a video of Zuleika Mandela as a, an, a, a champion speaking about the, the Enough uh, campaign. And, um, and I, I don't think there's any doubt on the, on the power of the lived experience, uh, but please do check out this video. It's extremely compelling on why this, this matters to, to Zuleika and what she is calling on decision makers to do. Um, the hashtag for the Enough campaign is Enough NCDs, um, and also there for the Our Views, Our Voices initiative is the hashtag NCD Voices. Thank you, and over to you, Jess. Thank you, Christina, so much. Um, we are slightly over time now, so just a, a final thank you to, to everyone uh, for, for joining the webinar, but also all of the support with the um, WHA preparations and the um, HLM preparations now. Uh, we'll have another webinar coming up um, covering whatever's new um, in HLM preparations, but also looking at the WHO regional committee meetings um, at some point over the summer. So look forward to reconnecting with everybody then. Thank you very much and speak soon. Bye. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's webinar. We thank you again for your participation. You may now disconnect.